All right. I have no other questions. John, outside of anything else, John? Uh, just a point, uh, the, where you say reset existing brick as required, that's actually stamped concrete. Okay. Just, for your, just for your own info. Yeah, I think there's some construction details that we got to add in there. Yeah. Uh, so that the contractors are aware of exactly what they got to do. Yeah, and Paul, I, I did speak to Jim Ryan uh, one or two weeks ago and told him that we do have details for that that construction. So. Okay. So we okay, can. So we can we can coordinate that. Yes. Okay, Jim, you have anything? No. Agreements. Everything looks good. Everything looks good. Thomas, everything was duly noted. Advertised. You got all the everything back. Yes, they re All public hearing notices are are accounted for. All right. At this point, then, I'd like to open it up to the public. Is there anybody from the public that has any concerns or questions about the application in front of us right now? Again, you have to wave or send an email or a chat chat to Robin. I don't see anyone with their hand up. All right, we'll give them a minute just in case. Quiet? Yep. <clears throat> All right. I'm going to suggest we uh, close the public hearing, but not vote on the, uh, or not deal with the resolution yet. And we'll leave it, if it's all right, with the board for a 10 day uh, open comment as been recommended. Um, just in Written case. comment. Uh, what's that? Written comment. Written comment. Thank you, Robin. Just in case someone wasn't able to uh, advise us during this meeting. Do I have a motion? No motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. All right, we're gonna move on to the next public hearing. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Good night, Paul. Oh, wow, that changed quick. We're gonna move on to the next uh, public hearing we have tonight, which is Atlantic Appliance, locations 2010 Maple Street. Do I have a motion to open the hearing? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Joe, you're on. You're still muted. Joe, you're on mute. There you go. I just need one second. No problem. Can I share, Robin? Yes. Okay. Everybody on board? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> uh, good evening. I'm Joseph Reena, the principal of Site Design Consultants, uh, and the project engineer for Atlantic Appliance. Uh, we are here tonight for a public hearing for a proposed commercial building, which will be the new home of Atlantic Appliance, which is currently in the Triangle Shopping Center. Uh, as you know, Atlantic Appliance has been a <clears throat> business in town for 45 years. Um, it has recently changed owner. The new owner is Joey Bukai. And um, with me tonight, uh, also presenting our, uh, our environmental consultant, which is Steve Marino from Tim Miller Associates, our landscape architect, Frank Giuliano, um, our architect, uh, uh, Gene Vitrano, <clears throat> and myself. So um, the, po the project con consists of two parcels. Uh, one is located 
at 2010 uh, Maple Hill Street and the others at 2015 um, Greenwood Street. <clears throat> the, main, the subject parcel where all the development is taking place is on the 210 uh, Maple Hill Street parcel is located between uh, the post office and the professional building to the right as you make your way um, south on uh, better on, uh, on uh, <clears throat> Maple Hill Street. The rear parcel is going to be mainly dedicated for uh, mitigation, uh, uh, which will be um, detailed much, la much later on in the presentation by Steve Marino. <clears throat> so the, the 2010 property is zone C2 and the 2015 property is zone C4. So the proposed use is, is consistent with the zoning um, that we're proposing. The, the site is currently, this is the uh, site on Maple Hill Street, which is uh, currently all wooded. Um, you can see the trees located on there. It, it gently to moderately slopes in a northeast direction. The other parcel, which is on uh, Greenwood Street, consists of uh, also a wooded parcel, except there is a stream running through the property, which is the Hallux Mill, which runs south to north. And then you have some wetland areas over in this area here, which Steve Marino will explain in more detail. Um, there's a sewer easement at this edge of the property, and, and the uh, public sewer goes through here, which eventually makes its way to the Greenwood Street plant. So the project is proposed is to construct a uh, building that has a square footage, a footprint square footage of 9,720 square feet. On the main level, it's going to be retail. On the lower level, which is access through the rear, is going to be warehouse. And on the second level, there's a, seven, a 6,270 square feet, which is going to be dedicated uh, probably to office. It hasn't been a fit finally decided on what it's going to be, but, but for now it's, uh, we're considering it, uh, that it's going to be office space. <clears throat> I'm missing a slide here. <clears throat> uh, in development of the site, we're going to uh, eliminate 167 trees, which are within the limited disturbance, 12 of which are compromised. And Steve Marino will give you a little more de uh, detail on that. So the project is proposed again is for this uh, 9,720 square foot building. The main entrance for employees and customers is going to be the most southerly entrance here. There's going to be parking in front of the building and to the side of the building here. <clears throat> there are two areas that um, we are reserving as banked, land banked parking, which means we're not going to develop those spaces currently. Uh, and, and they're going to be landscapes. So that's this area right in here and this area right in here. At some point in the future, they may be needed. Uh, the property owner is convinced that, uh, you know, based on his current uh, foot traffic in and out of his store and the number of employees that he has, uh, this should be um, adequate for, for what he needs at this point. <clears throat> Here's the laser. Okay. This entrance here is, is going to be dedicated to the service vehicles and delivery trucks. So delivery trucks will come in from uh, Route 35, which is to the uh, northwest come in this direction, loop into the site, back into a loading dock, which is, as I said, at a lower level, <clears throat> um, and deliver its goods there. Deliveries usually occur uh, between 9.30 and 10 a.m., and it's only one delivery per day. This area here will be the, the dedicated to these uh, delivery and service trucks, 
uh, where for the most part, they'll be gone all day doing their deliveries, doing their service calls and return at the end of the day, late afternoon. Uh, altogether, we've got 66 parking spaces shown. And as I said, 22 of those are gonna be land bank spaces. So that's this area here and this area here. <clears throat> the staffing uh, 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 is gonna be typically one person in the warehouse and uh, five sales staff and seven ma ma manager managerial staff uh, that are handling the back office uh, workings as well as um, uh, keeping an eye on and, and making sure all things are operating properly on the on the showroom floor. Okay. So to improve the site, first of all, we're, we're connecting to public sewer. The public sewer is located right here in the front. And uh, public water. We're going to have two service connections, one for domestic supply and one for fire supply. The existing water main is located right in front of the property here. The, as I said, the site slopes in, in a northeasterly direction. However, to achieve the grades that we need uh, to achieve ADA access, uh, when you come in, initially come into the site, and you turn left in the parking lot, which is in that area is going to be slightly raised because uh, this drops off in this area here. So in order to accomplish that, we're going to have a retaining wall along this edge here, and it's going to be six to six and a half feet at its highest point. As you work your way around, this, this site slopes downward, and the same with the uh, other entrance, as you work your way in, the site slopes down. All the drainage collected on the site will be brought to the rear of the site, to the stormwater management area, which I'll explain. So in order to, this, this project is located in a designated Main Street area in the New York City watershed. So uh, there's certain criteria we need to meet and so we, we have to get a permit from the New York City DP, as well as the MS4, which is the town of Yorktown, uh, which needs to comply with the New York State DEC regulations. So to accomplish that, we have to prepare a full stormwater pollution prevention plan, which we have already and it's been submitted. And part of the, part of the um, analysis that we have to do is we have to provide a, a, what's called a runoff reduction and what that is, is to, to take as much of the storm water and treat it for water quality with green infrastructure practices. So the green infrastructure practices that we've selected for the site is a partial green roof on the rear of the building. Uh, we've got storm water planters on different sides of the building along the driveway here. We've got porous pavers along this edge of the parking lot here. This hatched area here is, is going to be either a, um, a rain garden or some type of stormwater planter. And ultimately, everything ends up in our stormwater basin, which is a pocket wetland. And <clears throat> because of high groundwater conditions here, this is the most conducive form of treatment that we could provide uh, for um, for this site, and what happens is this is a this is a four bay here. Initially, all the water gets discharged into this. It acts as a settling basin. Then it follows this vegetated shallow channel here into a final polishing basin, which is at the far end of the of, of the pocket wetland. These areas in between are a low marsh area. So this, this, this mimics a wetland, but it's um, designed and 
there are specific plantings that go in there and specific hydraulics that take place that provide the necessary treatment. In addition, we've sized this in, to have an excess in capacity. Um, in order to be sensitive to the downstream condition where the, this area is known for flooding, the Hallux Mill, especially uh, you know, as you head north, um, there is a flooding situation there. So what we've done is um, oversized this for um, all the storm events to decrease the, the amount of peak volume that leaves our basin, therefore providing a benefit to the stream and to the, and to the flooding conditions in the stream. So this, this represents uh, what, what the re percent reduction that we're going to have. And as you could see, uh, it ranges from, you know, 60, 62% reduction in the lower storm events to a little over 10% in the 100 year storm event. So again, this is providing benefit uh, to, the, to our downstream neighbors. <clears throat> Um, as I stated, the, there's going to be retaining walls along certain areas. And I, I forgot to mention this one here. There's going to be a retaining wall here and another one here where you have that drop in, in elevation uh, in the parking lot. To the rear of the site, this is going to be our primary trash containment area. And this is going to be a, a cardboard compactor. There's a lot of cardboard that uh, waste that comes out of the warehouse. And that's going to be uh, compacted in, in this and then uh, disposed of, picked up on a, on a regular basis. This is our erosion sediment control plan. Um, this deals with how we're going to maintain um, the site and keep it stable during construction to avoid any offsite impacts especially since, uh, since the Hallux Mill is in, in the rear here. Um, these dark X's that you see, those are the trees that are gonna be removed that are eight inches or greater. Um, we've got stabilized construction entrances, soil stockpile areas, silt fence, which is, is kind of difficult to see at this, at this uh, scale, but there's a silt fence all around the site. And this area is gonna act as a sediment basin. So any uh, turbid water from the site will go in here and settle out before it has any, any point of discharge uh, off, off site. Um, we've prepared a, a, a lighting plan these are the this is the style fixture uh, for the, uh, the light post fixtures. It's, it has a uh, colonial type look. These are wall packs that are going to be uh, more for security lighting around the back of the building and sides of the building. These here, our pole lights are going here. One, two, three, four. Um, the building has an overhang here, and it has a, a portico over the front door. There's going to be uh, lighting underneath that, casting down, uh, which is represented in here. <clears throat> As you can see, we don't have extremely high light, high uh, light levels, so. Um, the site, uh, we believe, complies with the, uh, the town code as far as uh, lighting is concerned. There are additional couple of pole lights here and here and there. Uh-oh. Two. Okay. Um, this figure is represents our truck movements uh, to demonstrate that the trucks can enter the site uh, without hitting any obstructions, can get into the loading dock area, 
can exit the site. Um, we've agreed uh, to mandate that the trucks will only go out to the right and make their way straight up to 35 and not go um, up Maple to Veterans Road and through town. Uh, these are the profiles and details. Um, this is a cross section of the Paca wetland, so you can see how it's going to work. Four Bay. This is the low marsh area. This is the micro pool at the end. And this is a typical stormwater uh, planter. So to date, we, um, we've addressed most comments uh, during this, uh, during the, re the uh, uh, SHPO review, uh, SHPO returned a response that they, uh, that this site is within an archeologically sensitive area and they've required a phase A uh, archeological study, which we have underway. Otherwise we've addressed all other memos and comments that we received. Uh, all our uh, forms and applications are up to date and all our fees are in place. But at this point, I'm gonna turn over the, um, the mic to Steve Marino and I'm gonna let him take you through the mitigation plan. Then we'll go to uh, Frank, Giuliano, and then Gene Vitrano. Uh, this is Steve. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yep. All right, great. Uh, Joe, can you put up, um, this is this is my first sheet? Yes. Okay. Um, good evening, Steve Marino, Tim Miller Associates, uh, here to talk about uh, proposed mitigation for the Atlantic Appliance property. Um, as Joe mentioned, there is a, a wetland on the site. It's actually on that Greenwood Street parcel. Um, uh, the, the line for intents and purposes, the line of the wetland is about the eastern property line of the uh, Maple Hill Street parcel. There's a little, a little notch in there. Uh, generally, it, it's just off the property, the wetland boundary. Uh, the 100 foot buffer, therefore, does extend onto the property. Uh, the limits of that buffer are basically what's shown as the parking for the delivery vans. Uh, that's essentially the 100 foot buffer. So none of the development hardscape will be occurring in, the, in, the, in the, the buffer or the wetland. There will be no wetland disturbance and uh, no buffer encroachment with hardscape. It will all be uh, planted detention basin areas, et cetera. Um, as part of that plan, therefore, uh, Joe had requirements that he needed to meet with DEP and, and, and as part of the SWIP. Uh, he's accomplished that uh, since the last time you saw this plan. He has, he has uh, added that uh, stormwater planter um, for additional r runoff reduction. Um, and we've then, we've adjusted the landscape plan uh, to accommodate that. Uh, both that planter, the basin itself will be heavily planted. And then we've proposed additional trees and shrubs uh, in the buffer uh, to en further enhance that buffer. That buffer area back there is relatively uh, open with trees. There aren't a lot of trees on that back part of the property. So we will be adding more trees to that area. And uh, you know, there's heavy deer browse in this whole neighborhood and that property, basically this parcel and the adjacent parcel are trees. There's very little in the way of shrubs, except for the invasive honeysuckle shrubs that are back there. Um, so we're proposing to add native shrubs as well as native trees, ever, both evergreens and uh, deciduous trees. And as part of that then we will fence off that back area with deer fencing to make sure that, that our new plantings have a chance to, to grow and mature uh, compared to what the existing condition is. Uh, a second part of our mitigation, we do again recognize that we're in buffer. Uh, second part of our mitigation you see there to the right of the screen uh, will be a, a, an invasive species monitoring and control plan. Uh, that area there, uh, if you see on the, on the survey itself was a sewer easement so during the time of the sewer installation there, there must have been some disturbance uh, in that area. So that's almost entirely Phragmites at this point. I know we're all familiar with the Phragmites and the in invasive and uh, 
invasive, I guess, uh, manner in which it spreads through areas that have been disturbed. So we have a, a detailed proposal. You can see there's notes there on the right of the plan. There's a detailed proposal to go in, clear out the Phragmites, clear out vines and other things, non-native vines and things that might be growing in there, and, and then uh, give the native vegetation an opportunity to reestablish in there. And the third facet of our mitigation plan is there on the south side of the Greenwood Street parcel. Uh, as Joe mentioned, the Hallux Brook does flow through the Greenwood Street parcel. It uh, exits the Junior Lake, which is just to the south there off the map, uh, goes underneath Veterans Road through a large culvert and enters this site and then meanders through and, and continues to the north. Uh, again, Joe mentioned that there's a history of flooding problems in the neighborhood. What we're proposing is if you, if you look at that plan, you'll see there's the number 13 there, that's flag number 13B. Right adjacent to that is what used to be a swale that overflowed down into the, the Hallux Mill Brook um, and drained that area of wetland. Um, whether it was a tree falling down or some disturbance to the site, that swale is now blocked off and causes, the, when that basin fills up, it then flows to the north and creates some of that wetland that you see further to the north. What we're proposing is to reopen that swale, to lower the water level a little bit in that area, and then clear out the Phragmites and dead vegetation that's in there now. Uh, Joe, do you have my, my four-page PDF queued up there at all? This one? Uh, go one more page, Joe. Oh, back. Yeah. <laughs> Let's keep going back. Back one more, I think. Oh, there was one with photographs of the site and the neighboring. Uh, I, yeah, I don't, you don't have that one. That okay, I that's fine. Um, okay, so, all right, all right. so just to, a quick history of the site. When you look at that 1947 aerial photo there, that's uh, on the top of the screen. Uh, this site predating the Triangle uh, Shopping Center and post office and et cetera. This site was agricultural. Most of the neighborhood was at that time. You can see the cleared areas. Um, that first cleared area and right in the center of the property is the existing location of the post office and those two professional buildings. Our uh, development parcel is centered in the middle of that patch. And then just to the right of that where the brook flows through is the Greenwood Street parcel. And you can, and you can see again, it was, had recently been cleared and it was just some vegetation starting to grow back there. When you then get to the 1976 photo, you can see uh, the shopping center, you see the two professional buildings to the south, Veterans Road there now, uh, Greenwood Street's developed through there. Um, but both, both, these, both the subject parcels remained undeveloped and had now developed a forest uh, condition there. And go down to the, the more recent, the 2018 photo, and you can see now the post office is in place uh, so we're basically a last little island of, of wooded vegetation uh, in, in the neighborhood uh, with the Greenwood Street parcel and the Hallux Mill Brook, uh, the more sensitive parcel, um, just there to the east. Uh, Joe, if you go back to the, the big, the first screen. Yes, thank you. So that, that wetland at the south end of the site coming in off Veterans Road. Uh, I, I know I showed at the last meeting photographs of that. It's entirely Phragmites at this point. There's some dead standing red maples that used to be growing in that area have now flooded out due to the closure of that, that little uh, weep off there, the swale. Uh, and as well as you have couches, we have sofas, we have um, shopping carts, et cetera, uh, typical urban wetland indicator species uh, in there. So our proposal then is to clean that area out lower the level of the wetland in there while maintaining wetland, veg wetland conditions and, and revegetating that area, removing the Phragmites uh, and providing an overflow for that area to, to drain it down a little bit. What we've done is we've designed the, uh, the elevations of that area so that in the case of the 100 year storm in the Hallux Mill Brook, there's a little bit of an area now for the water to back up into this area. We're creating an extra two feet of freeboard in that area to control uh, additional flooding that might occur in the neighborhood. So that in addition to the overcapacity that Joe has in his basin on, on the development site, I think is gonna be a nice little contribution to the neighborhood 
to keep to 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 maintain some of the the cure some of the flooding problems that are happening downstream uh, further to the north. Steve, I have the phone. Uh, okay, good. Thanks, Joe. You see them? No. Oh, okay. Hold on. No worries. There we go. Thanks. Uh, so that upper left hand shot there, that's the, the wetland right off of uh, Veterans Road. You can see there's a, a, a ponded area and just beyond that, all Phragmites. The lower left is a, is a shopping cart in the Hallux Mill Brook. That center photo is a recliner that we found in that wetland again, adjacent to veterans. I guess it's a convenient place to park and throw things over the bank. Uh, the upper right hand corner is, the, is that sewer easement on Greenwood Street. Uh, again, since the installation of the, of the sewer line through there, there must have been, again, enough disturbance to get the Phragmites in there, get the, have it get a hold. And now that's entirely frags, so we'll go in there and clean that out. And that, that bottom, bottom right hand shot is again, is the Veterans Road wetland with, um, with the density of Phragmites. Again, this was taken in the winter, so you don't get the full effect. In the summertime, both of these areas are eight to 10 feet of Caribbean. Oh, there we go, okay. Um, eight to 10 feet of Phragmites growing entirely through those areas. All right, Joe, if you wanna to go to the, that, last, that last screen, Uh, there's the blow up of that. Something happened here. Can't okay. Figure it out. Okay. There you go. Um, so this is just a blow off of the of the existing wetland line on the Greenwood Street parcel. Uh, the area that we're proposing to clear out the Phragmites as well as expand that wetland. You can see there on the right hand side, right there, you can see that that upper line of the wetland, uh, we're going to be expanding that further to the east to make the wetland larger there as well. Again, it's, it's more area for store, uh, flood storage as well as creating a larger, um, more vibrant wetland by removing the frags and putting native species back in there. Then you can see there that our proposed outflow channel that will allow uh, that area to drain down for the most part, still be wet enough to be wetland, but drain down so that there's uh, storage available should the stream uh, come up and overflow its banks. We have some room for the water to back up in, into this area here. All right, Joe, back to that main screen. Yes, thank you. Um, as Joe mentioned, we did a tree survey. We just recently in the last month updated that tree survey to include all the trees eight inches and greater on the site. Um, we did find a total of 182 trees, some of which were dead. Um, a, a large number of trees were also covered with vines. Since, since deer have been going in there and, and chewing all the vegetation out, all the, there's like again, no shrub layer, very little in the herbaceous layer, it's all just trees. Um, the things that are left are things like climbing bittersweet, which have gone in and, and are covering a, a good deal of the trees out on the site. 90% um, or more of the trees are red maples. They're not, a, it's not a long lived species. So there's a lot of standing dead out there, a lot of dead branches. Um, it's not really what you'd call a high, a high value uh, forested area. We did find some hemlocks and oaks out there, very few, but want to identify that they are out there. Um, so I think a, a total of about 160 to 170 trees will be coming out. We're proposing as part of our mitigation, uh, 30 trees, 60 something shrubs, additional trees will be planted in, the, uh, in that stormwater planter. We'll put some additional trees in that area of Phragmites where the, sewer line was, where the sewer line is, as soon as we know what's growing in there. But this time until we can clear that frags out and get a better idea of what's actually growing there, uh, we don't know what needs to be replaced. And then uh, as you'll hear from Frank in a couple of minutes, uh, we will be, there is a landscape plan on file for the developed portion of the property will include uh, clearly more vegetation. Um, so again, that will add back to the, to the uh, tree count and vegetation on, on the property. Uh, looking at the town's tree code, it does seem that this project as part of a commercial site plan um, 
does fit under the tree law in terms of a, a, an approved landscape plan. So the, the discretion is with the, the board issuing the approval to decide how many trees need to go back there, in there and of what type and size. So, you know, we've made our proposal here and we'll, I'm sure we'll continue to talk about the landscape plan and, and, and tree and the tree code as it applies to this site. Steve, not to interrupt, have you seen the, like, is the memo today from the tree commission? No, we have not, Rich. All right, we're gonna have to get you a copy of that. Okay, yes, please. Thank you. All right, Joe, so I think that wraps it up. I think Frank is queued up next. Yeah. Okay. Frank, you on? Yes, it's Frank Giuliano, landscape architect. Um, Joe, you're uh, working it from your end? Yes, so okay. tell me where you wanna go. All right, uh, first let me just explain that we did appear in front of Ibaka, and there was only one comment uh, after the review that we attended, and that was to add some screening uh, in front of the wall, between the wall and Maple Hill Street, uh, which we did do. What this plan is, we added as many uh, large trees in to the uh, site as possible without uh, hindering view lines or anything for the cars. The other thing is that we've only used 100% of the plantings are native material. The, um, if you look at the bank parking areas, the one on Maple Hill Street, and then the one backing up to the medical building, uh, those are all heavily planted. There is some uh, lawn area uh, in the uh, front of the building. And the reason that this lawn area and also the area in the second bank area by the uh, building where there's some juniper is very low so that there's some areas to uh, push snow. Otherwise, uh, if it was all heavily planted, it, there would be nowhere on the site to uh, plow snow and stockpile it without using up parking spaces. The, um, the north end, which abuts the post office, is planted pretty heavily. There's nothing, uh, there's no windows on that post office side. However, um, we felt that it should be screened so that we don't look at the, the, that kind of no man's land between this property line and the post office. And the uh, maintenance on the post office side is not, uh, is, is, is not very aesthetic. The, on the opposite side, for the, um, uh, where it adjoins the medical buildings, we're providing as much screening as possible uh, so that when the parking, the parking lot from the medical building has some screening into our uh, parcel. The streetscape is pretty heavily planted. Again, all native material. There's a short wall that uh, comes from the uh, truck access area and uh, that screened. And then the street trees that are consistent with whatever else is on Maple Hill Street. The uh, sizes of the trees are substantial. Um, three and a half to four inch caliper trees. And the size of the plantings are pretty substantial. So whatever green space is left on this site um, will be heavily planted. It probably will be the greenest spot, uh, definitely on Maple Hill, but uh, probably in the entire downtown area once it's uh, completed. If there's any questions. Frank, are you involved in the, uh, the rooftop? Yes, the rooftop, the, roof, uh, the rooftop is going to be, um, you know, green roofs in this area of the country are uh, uh, the only feasible plant are sedums. And there are companies on Long Island who grow the sedums specifically for our Northeast climate. And um, they come in actual um, uh, on pallets. And once the soil is put down, which is only four to six inches of, um, of a light packed soil, these mats will be delivered. And basically the day it's uh, installed, it's done. And it needs to be irrigated. Uh, the good thing about the sedums are that they do stay succulent, meaning they have moisture in them all year, so that there's no chance of um, uh, a fire. The plants won't be uh, dried out like a, a normal planting in a wetland. The sedums have proved in this climate to be the most adaptable 
and uh, long lived. We have CD, uh, sedum roofs that go back uh, in the town of um, Scarsdale that go back six years and there's no issues with them at all. Okay, thank you. I have a couple questions. Sure. Is that okay, Rich? Please, by uh, all means. Frank, uh, what is the species that you're using for screening on the north side that looks as though it's sort of pink colored? Okay. Uh, Joe, could you highlight the plant list? Are you able to enlarge that? Yep. It's so the VI uh, uh, these, they are viburnum dentatum, which is a native viburnum, but the Chicago luster is a very upright variety of it. So uh, they are not evergreen, but remember that's also in the uh, wetland planter. So it's a viburnum that will take the wet conditions. Uh, it gets very thick and um, a lot of basal growth. It's not a tree. They're very heavily, uh, they're shrubs that will grow up to six to eight feet tall. Um, and the uh, Chicago luster is upright and a very shiny green leaf. In a, a mild winter like we just had, it will remain uh, evergreen. In a normal winter, they'll lose their leaves in November and regain them again uh, by this time of year. Okay, so it will appear to be hedge-like and can be maintained as a hedge, more or less. That's exactly it, yes. Okay. Secondly, um, in the front of the building, the plantings there, except for the plants that are, are in front of the wall, those are actually, most of that stuff is behind the wall, right? On, yes. And, and up elevated three or four feet or whatever it is, correct? That's right. Actually, not not quite, John. It's it's a little less than three or four. As you get towards this end of this end, it's a little higher. Okay, it's a little higher. I mean, and so you're I, almost at, you're at grade level. So I, I assume that between the wall and the edge of the sidewalk, as shown, is is uh, lawn or grass. Yes. Okay. I'm suggesting that we think about moving the sidewalk in and creating a a buffer strip. You know, a planting strip that could. Mm -hmm and we can do some street trees uh, and then keep it a little bit for snow storage. So this way you can clean, clear up the sidewalk a little bit easier during heavy snows. Uh, and then my last question for you, Frank, is on the south side above the wall where there, you're actually building parking, what is the treatment there? I know it's very close to the property line, but what is gonna happen in there? Um, Joe, are you, you want to right here, John? Yeah, right in there. There's nothing there because of, uh, the wall comes almost right up to the property line. Right, but you, you're going to do something with it after construction of the wall. Oh, well, it'll be graded and seeded. Okay, it'll be seeded then, right? Yeah. Because okay. the, their parking lot comes almost right up to the property line as well at the medical building. It'll be seeded with grass? With grass. Okay, and, and so you'll and, have- and The reason is that right now, all their snow is piled right there too. So okay. uh, anything we do plant, if we did, we've got, Joe, how much room do we have between the wall and the property line there? About maybe 18 inches to a foot. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So you'll have how that's going to be maintained on your maintenance plan, right? Yes. Okay. We'll have a maintenance plan that goes along with this. As, as you okay. Say. And then I have a question for Steve, which is, on this southern wetland that you're improving? Yes. So you, you said you're going to lower it a little bit. I want to be clear. You're lowering the water level to a certain extent? We're watering the lower level, John, and as, as part, yes, right, right. By reopening that swale, we'll be lowering the water level a little bit. Um, at the same time, when we pull the root masses out for the frags, because once we cut the frags, you know, if you leave the roots in there, in a situation like this, it's just going to grow back. So the proposal is to probably go in there with a small machine and take the, the, the root clumps out. And by pulling those out, that'll also lower it six, to, six inches to a foot by, by just getting those roots out. So you, you'll, you'll lower the water level, but you'll also deepen it. Is deepen that, it a little bit, yes. Is that clear? Okay. Yes. So what you're doing will actually improve the function of the wetland, correct? That's the plan. Yes, exactly. Okay. All right. That's all I had on that. And then just one other comment uh, uh, point actually for Joe is 
on the lighting plan, I think the wall pack, the, spe the specified wall pack there is probably not supported by the, by the uh, lighting code. And it, it looks as though it does have a, a horizontal throw to a certain extent, and that should probably be fully shielded. That, that looks like the standard security light. Okay. So we'll, maybe. We'll, we'll address that. Yeah. yeah, in particular, since you have some poles around, I, I'm not sure you need to throw light all over the place. Yeah, I mean, this is more, uh, as I said, <clears throat> around the, the sides and back of the building. Yep. Okay, that's all I have. Okay, um, so we'll move on to, to Gene. So Gene, you, you need to um, share your screen. Joe, I will, but can you put your site plan back up for a minute? I just want to discuss the uh, the entry portico and also where we're going to locate the uh, the emergency generator. So again, Joe, if you can point out, I don't know if you could see my mouse on there. Uh, where the en no. so the entry portico is going to extend into the uh, setback window. So we're going to request a zoning variance for that canopy. We mentioned that at the uh, working meeting for planning last month and also at Abaca. And then also, Joe, if you can show where the emergency generator is gonna be behind the uh, trash container, lower southeast corner, southeast, keep going that right back in there. Right, and we're gonna provide proper screening around that. Those were two issues that we mentioned at Abaca and also uh, at the uh, planning work meeting. I don't have those on my drawing, so I just wanted to bring them up while you were there. I'll bring my screen up now, Joe, thank you. Mm -hmm. yes. I have to stop sharing. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Hi, Joe. All right, let me see if I can figure this out. I'm a bit of a dinosaur here, so you have to bear with me. Ah. Can everyone are. see that? Okay. Yes? Not yet? No. All right, hold on. Let me figure. Good thing my daughter just coming in. Let me have her come. Oh, Alex, I want to bring up my, uh, I want to bring up my uh, PDF. Okay, it's coming up now. It's coming up now? It's coming up now? Okay. All right, you have it now? Yep. Thank goodness for daughter number three. Thank you. <laughs> All right, my name is Gene Vitrano. I am with Sal Mancini Architect and Gary Spilatro Architect. Uh, we have, as I said, appeared before the uh, planning board at a workshop and also uh, back at a workshop. Uh, I will I'll go over the five architectural sheets and then I have a rendering that we did not have available at those meetings. Uh, again, as Joe mentioned, the building is uh, 108 by 90, the lower level which I will zoom in on, will be warehouse space. Uh, we'll have a uh, entry stair, uh, elevator shaft, storage for uh, records, uh, payroll and so on in the front right corner of the building. Somewhere in the back, not sure location yet, we'll have a break room toilet for the warehouse man. And at the uh, loading dock, separate exit for the uh, warehouseman, and then also a small office with a window viewing out where the trucks will be backing in and out of that space. That has not changed from our last appearance. Uh, the roof plan has m remained the same except for the fact, and I'll show you when we get to the second floor plan, that now we have a large section of that space that's going to be the green roof. Uh, we'll also have uh, mechanical equipment stored up there. And then based on recommendations from John and Abaca, uh, this wall now will actually be a full Gambrel roof. And once I have the size of the mechanical equipment, if we have to add additional screening, we will uh, along the top of that Gambrel roof. Uh, let me go to the next drawing. Okay. Let me Start with the second floor. Again, second floor plan. These are the stairs. Uh, 
the second means of egress from the second floor that will go down to the first floor. There'll also be a, a, a hallway that will allow the owner to access this back flat roof. We propose to put a patio up there with some screening. This will be the green roof and then mechanical will be at the uh, south end of the uh, second floor. As Joe mentioned, we have no tenants in mind for the second floor yet, so we're just gonna, we'll build it out as a white box. Uh, we have the elevator, stairs, and we'll designate the entire south section of that second floor for office, break room, and uh, necessary toilets. And we just developed a range pole here to make sure that we didn't exceed the uh, uh, recommended uh, height of the building. All right, first floor, let me uh, remove this. Oh, apologize. All right, first floor again, this is our portico or covered canopy in the front uh, with the uh, roof that extends across the entire front of the building to protect any uh, 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 grills, barbecue, any summer uh, appliances that may be displayed out there. Uh, we recess the entry. We have two areas in the front that we're going to display kitchens, one on the right, one on the left, and they'll both be uh, completely uh, visible from the, uh, under that uh, front canopy. We've established a separate entrance to the second floor. Again, elevator. Elevator also goes to the basement besides second floor. The staff for Atlantic Appliance will have access in the back of that elevator so that they're the only ones that can get downstairs to the warehouse. It'll be locked out for anyone uh, entering from the uh, second floor lobby. Stairs to the second floor, and then again, stairs down from uh, Atlantic Appliance. We haven't established the layout yet of displays. We will do that once I have an opportunity to meet with uh, Mr. Vukai and his uh, suppliers, and then we'll establish how we're going to display. And again, the entire floor will be uh, for uh, retail display. Let me blow it up a little bit, and then I'll walk you through the office space. So again, everything remains at the south uh, portion of that, that floor. We'll have a service and parts section just next to its service parts checkout, employee break room. They'll have a small uh, Dwyer unit kitchenette, ADA unisex uh, restroom. Bookkeeper general manager will have her own space. Uh, this will be the administrative staff, which I call the sister's office. Uh, they also have storage and storage. We'll have uh, custodial and cleaning supply cabinet accessible from the uh, retail space. Provide two ADA unisex uh, restrooms, drinking fountain, slop sink, and then off of the administrative offices, uh, I apologize, let me go back. We will have a break room with a kitchenette, a changing room, they'll have a private toilet, storage, and then the owner's office Again, private office with uh, his own toilet. Let me go back now. All right, front elevation. Uh, and I do have a perspective, so I didn't do this in color. We've modified the signage a little bit. In speaking with the owner and his, his, his daughters, they thought perhaps if we had block letters that stood out and were pinned to the building, it may be a better effect. So what we did... Uh, I reached out to Tim at uh, Signs Inc. He's presently working on three variations of signage for us. Once I have that, I understand I have to go back before Abaca and do a separate uh, sign submission. So once we have that, uh, then again, I'll give it to this board also. Uh, so again, Atlantic Appliance, if we do pinned letters, would look something like that. And then what I did is I went back to the original sign that I presented to planning and just so that Tim at Signs Inc. had a better feeling for what we were looking for, we were going to put logo with the Vukai building beneath it. I gave him all the dimensions. This is the logo that will be in this placard. And if that's the direction we go, that will be up here at this gabled end. Uh, if we go with the pin letters, we'll move the Vukai building down at the portico canopy, and then we'll just leave the 
logo of Atlantic Appliance, which is the two blue triangles at the two gables and at the gable of the portico. On the south elevation, and again, when we get to the, uh, uh, sorry, when we get to the rendering, as the south elevation, uh, these windows are all the offices that exist on the south portion of the uh, main floor. These are the proposed windows for the second floor. And again, the logo up at the upper, uh, upper gable roof. Based on the suggestion of Ibaka, we widened the space to create a little bit uh, of a, a break. And rather than having all horizontal siding the same color from the front to the back, they suggested we put in a banding to tie in the blue with the gray. So this is a uh, fascia along the entire south side of the building. Uh, they also suggested that we try to create a, uh, a return to the hip roof at this end here and here. And it, after we played around with it, we just really weren't comfortable with it. So we left it at uh, just a gable. And again, I think when you see the, the rendering, you'll appreciate, uh, appreciate what it looks like. Uh, they also suggested that we widen the columns, which we did. So we widened all the columns. We took the pediments up, and then you'll see in the rendering, we continue that line up underneath the uh, eaves of the gable roof. Uh, we also are going to match the stone base wall will be the same stone that we're using for the landscaping walls. Uh, and uh, it was discussed and suggested at the Abaca meeting that that's going to be a uh, cut granite in the gray family. So once we've established that and uh, picked out that material, again, we'll present that back to the board. Uh, with that also, John suggested that we put together a proposed north elevation facing the post office. We didn't have that initially. And to put some windows on there to break it up, I'd like to ex explain how the windows ended up at this configuration. Uh, these windows on the second floor match the windows on the south elevation. There is a fourth window here. If we put this fourth window here, this fits right in line with the demising wall between the second means of egress from that second floor and the second floor white box. So we left it out. Uh, John also suggested that we put in some clear story windows. Uh, we put in a series of four, not knowing exact location yet, because I think this is going to be dependent upon how we display the uh, uh, the appliances inside the showroom because again we'll have some kitchen at, kitchens actually laid out and then based on their layout we may slide these uh, you know back and forth a bit. This door is the uh, second means of egress from the the main floor. Uh, I cannot go towards the front of the property because what happens is the driveway is too close to the building for me to allow for an ample width for the set of stairs. So we elected to let that stairs run towards the back of the property. And then we just developed the rear elevation. Uh, again, this is the entire back of the showroom or main floor. The only window right now is in the owner's office. Uh, these are windows that we propose for the second floor. And again, this is the, uh, the uh, faux uh, gambrel roof. As I said, once we establish the height of the mechanical equipment, if we have to go up higher, we will. Right now, it's five feet above the uh, finish elevation. This is the loading dock. And again, you can see, as Joe laid out, the truck will back down so that the bed of that tractor, I apologize, the trailer, will be level with the loading dock. This is the door exit for the warehouse man, and that's the window in his office. Uh, now... I don't want that one. I want this one. All right. This. Let me see if I can get this. All right. So this is the proposed street elevation. Portico with the logo, again, logos. This particular rendering shows the signage as we had it before we discussed with uh, Mr. Vukai and his staff the possibility of pinning the letters up there. So if that were the case, this is out. 
the Vakai building signage will go here. This logo will be smaller. And then obviously, whoever the tenant or tenants are on the second floor, their signage will be here. Uh, again, we beefed up all the columns. We carried the line up. Uh, initially, and I'll go back to the first rendering. Uh, that's not it. Initially, the rendering, we had the stone wall up high, and it was just too intrusive. So what we did is we went back, we revisited, and we determined to lower that wall. I think, Joe, did you say it was going to be at 22 inches above grade? The, the wall's going to be 12 inches above grade. 12 inches, all right. All right, so this wall will be 12 inches, and the stone will match, right, the stone wall in the front, our base, and this stone wall will all be the, uh, the cut granite. Right now, we're looking at the blue and white. Again, uh, when we went to Abaca, they suggested that, uh, or blue and light gray, they suggested that rather than having this all light gray, that we break this up so we created with vertical lines uh, a blue section in the center under that gable roof, and then the rest of it will be gray. The bottom is going to be uh, stuccoed. Uh, I'm assuming we'll let that be a gray similar to the, uh, the horizontal siding. The materials we're working with right now, uh, we're proposing a horizontal hardy board with a seven inch exposure. Uh, all the trim will be an AZAC. We'll uh, use AZAC on the columns, the corner boards, uh, the freeze boards, uh, the slate roof we're proposing. Right now we're looking at Da Vinci Roofscape, which is a uh, composite uh, roofing material. And we're proposing that to be a slate, a slate gray. Uh, that's about it. <laughs> if you have any questions, I'm open to them. Thank you. What else you got, Joe? Okay. <clears throat> um, Gene, could you unshare? Say that again, Joe? Just do a stop share. Stop share. Okay, so let me see how to stop share. <laughs> stop share. Okay. Mm -hmm. Bravo. I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm a dinosaur. When I, <laughs> I have to call my daughter to come running back down. <laughs> uh, yeah, so just a couple of things. Uh, Gene, <clears throat> Gene hit on the uh, need for a variance. Uh, so the, the um, front of the building comes out beyond the setback line. So we're going to need a 10-foot variance for, <clears throat> for basically from this point on. The uh, uh, portico is, you know, uh, the closest point, so we're going to need a variance for that. Um, we're also going to need uh, a special use permit uh, for uh, exterior displays. We're going to use this area in front of the building for, you know, occasional displays, mostly in the uh, grill weather. So there'll probably be grills out there and, and whatnot. That'll be brought out in the morning and uh, returned at night. <clears throat> so um, with that said, the only thing that we, we feel we haven't addressed yet and we, um, we have to take care of, uh, which if you so choose to close the public hearing, we don't think uh, would affect you doing that, is, um, is the uh, uh, SHPO request to do a phase A uh, archaeological study, which um, uh, we're hoping and anticipating that it's not going to be, uh, it's not going to yield anything of concern. <clears throat> um, John, I would ask you, how do we, uh, how do we handle that? The phase one? Yes. That should be done probably before you're done here. All right, so we should, no matter what, keep it open. I would say. Okay. Does the sofa fall into that category of an <laughs> I'm surprised Frank Giuliano didn't replant it. That's circa Archie <laughs> Bunker. Yeah, it looked like it. <laughs> uh, just one other thing, Joe. Do yeah. you, I think it's probably wise to uh, apply for the zoning variance as soon as possible, right? Yes. I, I, I'm not sure how they're operating or if they're operating. Um, I don't know if you know. Well, they, they will be at some point soon, sooner than later. Okay. So, so, so if the, you know, if the, if the planning board is, um, 
okay with with our going for the variance, then we would we would surely like to get a letter of endorsement from you to the zoning board. I, I think we talked about that at the last meeting we had. Any objections from the board? No, none here. Right, um, done with your presentation. Go ahead, John. Yes. Sorry. Just one last minor thing. Uh, in the rendering uh, on the lower retaining wall that's close to the building, it shows a fence. Is, it, is that the fence that you'll be using? And can you put the detail on your set? There's a, there's a guardrail there, actually, Joe said yeah. last time. Yeah, there's actually. <clears throat> because there's a drop behind it. Yeah. There's actually. The, what the renderer didn't pick up, John, there's a guardrail yeah. there yeah. in front of the railing. So we will be using, yes, that's the railing we, we're going to be using. We will add a detail uh, to the plan for that. And you'll have a guardrail in front. And there'll be a, gu a timber guardrail in front there. Okay. There. So, and there, there's also a timber guardrail at the end of the, um, the access aisle here, as well as um, in this area facing Maple Hill. And it's, you know, it's all timber guardrail, but, but everywhere where we have an elevation difference, so this, <clears throat> this railing is gonna wrap all the way around this section of the parking lot, all the way to the end of the building here. And um, it, here it's just gonna run this stretch here. Okay. All right. Thank you, Joe and team. Thank um, you. Any members of the planning board have any concerns, questions? None here. Nope. All right, John, I know we spoke. Anything else? No, I don't have anything else at present. Thomas, everything duly uh, noticed? Yes, sir. Okay, hey, Jim, any late. issues? No issues from me. Robin, you ready to go to the public? Yes. All right. So. Do we have any comments, concerns, or questions from the public for the applicant? I'll invite um, Susan Siegel would like to speak. Welcome, Susan. Yes, hello there. Okay. Thank you. I hope you're well. Okay, yes, I am, and I hope you're all well. Uh, just to clarify, I, judging by what I've heard and seen, the members of the planning board present are you, Rich? Bill Lascala and John King Card, is that correct? And John Savoca and Rob Garrigan were here also. Yeah, oh, okay. the only one that's not here is Aaron Bach. Okay, I could, couldn't see this. This is all very new to me and I'm not very technical, <laughs> as Robin welcome. knows. Welcome aboard. <laughs> okay, um, let me just make it clear that I'm speaking as a resident and not as a member of, of any group. All right. Um, in general, I, I support the application and I believe that this new home for Atlantic Appliance will be a very welcome addition to the Yorktown Heights um, business hamlet. Um, I've been a customer of Atlantic for more years than I'd like to think about. Um, but I do have some concerns about whether the plan, as it was presented in a, in a very, very thorough presentation, conforms to the town's tree law and the law is very specific and very clear requirements for a tree permit. As some of you know, I've been involved with the, the tree permit issue for um, basically since 2010. Specifically, the tree law requires the applicant to submit a tree mitigation plan that addresses and compensates for the impact of the removal of protected trees and also, and this is critical, the removal or disturbance of protected woodlands. The mitigation re plan requirement is a shall, not a may. Mitigation is not optional. It is required. The law also clearly, very clearly requires that the mitigation plan shall, again, shall, not may, be submitted to both the Conservation Board and the Tree Commission for their review and comment. Um, I heard you say, uh, Rich, that there was a memo from the Tree Conservation Board, and uh, I think it might be helpful if that can be read out at, at, as part of this hearing so that its comments can be shared by, by other people. Um, like wetlands, um, like wetlands, excuse me? I, I said we could do that or we'll probably have Thomas do it. Okay, uh, yeah, I, I 
it, it's probably very short. Like wetlands, trees and woodlands, as, as I'm sure you know, provide multiple functions and benefits to the town. That's why when trees and or woodlands have to be removed or disturbed to make way for development, the loss of those functions needs to be mitigated. The key word is the functions that these trees and woodlands provide. We've done this for decades uh, with wetlands, but since 2012, the town has recognized the need for mitigation when trees and woodlands are removed or disturbed. But there's no record that there's a separate and district distinct tree mitigation plan has ever been prepared as part of the Atlantic Appliance Development Plan for either tree removal or woodlands re removal or disturbance. In all the planning board sessions leading up to this hearing, I don't recall any discussion about the extent to which a protected woodland would be removed or disturbed. The applicant has submitted a landscape plan that's been very carefully reviewed today that identifies some new plantings, both trees and shrubs. But as the planning board knows, a landscape plan is not a mitigation plan. And a landscape plan isn't a substitute for a tree mitigation plan that addresses the lost functions of removed trees and disturbed woodlands. Again, if I repeat the word lost functions uh, uh, many times, it's because that's the critical essence of the tree law. Mr. Marino did an excellent job of describing the wetlands mitigation plan, but it really wasn't clear that that was a substitute for a separate and distinct tree mitigation plan. Again, that deals with the functions, not of the wetlands, but of the trees and the woodlands. Also, the stormwater plan doesn't address all the lost functions that we, that we need to talk about. The, the mitigation section of the tree law is very flexible, and it gives the planning board the ability to work with the applicant to develop a very reasonable and a meaningful and, and cost-effective mitigation plan that is very custom tailored to the site. And the mitigation plan isn't just the replanting of a fixed number of trees. The plan, as the board knows, can be a combination of measures, some of which don't necessarily involve replanting. And the plan could also, those measures could be on site, but they could also be off site. Susan? You're, yeah, yeah, I just not, have a few not, more comments. Not, not, to cut, not to cut you off, we, we, we're aware of the tree law. I don't think we, we want to go through the whole purpose of the tree law right now. But to your point, and we'll have Thomas read it in, the uh, TCAC did issue a letter. Unfortunately, the applicant hasn't had the, uh, the uh, chance to take a look at it yet. So what I would say is hold tight as this is why these things get, you know, sent out to the various boards. And we look forward to uh, the, the team for Atlantic Compliance to come up with those plans, as you stated. So we appreciate your comments, not to cut you off, but we don't need to go into the, I think the, with all due respect, the history of the, the law and it will get addressed. Okay, um, well, I'm glad, I'm no, glad that you- I don't want to talk to that real quick. Have you seen No, that? but I'm glad that you, re you recognize that, that before you issue a tree permit, it needs a mitigation plan well, and that, that mitigation, that's why we yeah. sit with the board, Susan. So that, okay, that and so just we, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, if if you just adjourn the hearing and we'll, let we'll, them, we'll, we're going to make that decision as a board. All right, because I your input though. The town worked for more than two years. I, you know, I, on this listen, on this piece, you, know, you were part of it, back, Rich. I listen. I appreciate what you're saying, but we don't need to get into that here. We understand. That's why we forward it off to these other agencies. That's why they take a look at it. We've got the memo back. We will address it. And I appreciate your input. Thank you. Do you have anything? Okay, else? okay. and just, just one, one other thing. Was the application back in, I think in December when the application first came in, that also should have been referred to the Tree Commission well, and I was believe, it? I believe it was, we'll double check that. Yeah, I appreciate that because I think there have been some other applications currently before the board that I am concerned about that they're not being properly um, referred out to the tree commission. We will certainly make sure that's done if it hasn't been. Okay, thank you so, thank you so very much. And thank you, Steve and, and Joe for a very good presentation. Yeah, well done, gentlemen. Very good, very good. 
All right, so if there's nothing else from the board, anybody else from the public? Robin, did we see anything? I do not. All right, I'm gonna make the motion to adjourn the uh, public hearing until we uh, cross some T's and dot some I's. Any objections? Why are we adjourning it? Why can't we close it? Because there's too many details that haven't been addressed yet. We, we, especially that historical. Yes, that, that, that's the state. We can't, we can't just, that's got to be something that's got to be addressed. But we can move it along, Bill, because we're having meetings every week now. So, yeah. you know. And I, do, I have to say, personally, I like the application. I think it was very well presented. Um, Excuse I me, I sent in a question to Robin. Yes, Mark just sent me a message. Mark? Lieberman. Oh, okay. He would like to know, how can you change a wetland and still call it a wetland? I would leave hey. that to Steve. <laughs> um, I guess, oh, so we're, I guess we're probably talking about the wetland along uh, on Veterans then, that South Wetland. Well, I mean, a wetland is an area that's wet, that has a certain type of soil and has certain ki uh, kind of vegetation growing out of it. Our proposal is to maintain the wetness, which is what drives everything else, but clean out the nuisance vegetation and, and invasive vegetation that's growing there and replace it with native vegetation that will provide a better function as a wetland in, in, in our kind of ecosystem here. Um, if we leave it the way it is, animals don't use it. Um, the vegetation is a monoculture of one species, which is a nuisance and gets into everything. Uh, the fact that this area has become flooded has already killed the, the trees that were growing in there previously. So our plan is to modify it, uh, not to replace it. It's to modify what's there and, and, and enhance it in a way that makes for a better wetland. Joe, you, uh, Steve, you're actually expanding the wetland, are you not? And we are expanding the wetland by about 50%, yes. And I think what's important about this application um, is the benefit that work in that wetland is going to have towards that area that we've heard about with other applications. Correct. Yes. I recall we had that application on Greenwood Street. A lot right. of the public concern was regarding flooding from the brook on their side of the street and how would that property affect the flooding. Uh, so, so we're sure the same questions exist here and we have a kind of a two-prong approach to try to, to help with that condition. What, what's nice about your presentation, Steve, is you go back to the county site and get those old aerials, which really tells a tale there, especially with the history. Sure, it does. Yeah, we appreciate that. There we are. Let's look at that top photo. Oh, there it is. <laughs> yeah, amazing. So, Mr. Lieberman, did that answer your question? Uh, it's not my expertise. Uh, it's just a curiosity. Uh, because everything I heard in the past during the wetlands hearings was it takes decades to form a wetlands and changing a wetlands, uh, it's no longer a wetlands. It's, uh, it's a man-made project. No. And I've been working on projects similar to this and expansion and restoration of existing wetlands for many years, over 20 years now. And, and I can tell you that as long as you have the right base conditions, and we know this area is wet, we know that the soils are organic and hold a certain amount of nutrients in the soil. As long as we can maintain those conditions and revise the, uh, the plant community there, we can, we can certainly make an existing wetland better. And in this particular case, we're not trying to take an area that isn't wetland and making it wetland. That's a little bit more of a complicated process. Here we have an area that's already wetland and we just want to clean it out and improve it. And change the furniture. And change, and, and change, change the, furniture. the furniture. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for the question. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> All right, we missing anything? So the hearing is adjourned. Can I have a motion? Or a no second? motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All's in favor. Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, guys. Frank, good seeing you. Thank you. Hope to see you soon. I hope so, too. At a real live meeting. <laughs> yes. Good night. That'd be nice. Good night. All right. We have one more public hearing.
This is the Nestle Waters, but before we get to the public hearing, <clears throat> we have to talk about uh, waiving the public informational hearing for this. I think what we discussed at the last meeting is due to the nature of what's going on here that um, <clears throat> the public hearing itself would, would cut it. So if there's no objection from the board, do I have uh, first a motion to waive the public informational hearing for the Nestle Waters? Motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Did that cover that, Robin? Yes. All right. Then I'm going to make a motion to open the uh, public hearing for Nestle Waters located at 3775 Crown Pound Road. I have a motion. No motion. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Joe, you're on. Okay. I'm going to share, Robin. Go ahead. Joe, just for a point of interest, too, we, we got, oh, God, I forgot to read that tree mount one was the last application. Uh, we got two emails um, from residents oh, about the, uh, about the project. Have you seen those? No. Thomas, is there any way to get those to Joe? I just forwarded them to him. Thank you, Robin. And I apologize, Susan, I, I was gonna read that memo in and we'll have to get that out there. All right, Joe. Uh, do I need to look at these emails right now, Robin? Well, Mr. Campolo is here with us tonight. He was the uh, author of one of them, correct, Mr. Campolo? That is correct. Yeah. Uh, so. Oh, there he is. Good evening, all. How are you, sir? All right. Should I express my concerns? No, wait. We're going to let the applicant do their presentation, just like the other applications, and then we'll ask if there's any input from the public, and then we'll talk to you. Okay. I will right. wait. Thank just you. hold tight. Thank you. We appreciate you being here. Pleasure. All right, Joe. Okay. Uh, good evening, Joseph Rina, the principal of site design consultants and the uh, project engineer for Nestle's <clears throat> Waters North America. Um, the proposed project here is reoccupying of a, a site that, that um, has been vacant for several years. Uh, historically, the site was the um, location of the uh, Verizon or uh, prior to that Bell Telephone uh, line crew um, headquarters and uh, they uh, did all their pole repair and transformer repair and wire work out of this facility uh, for the region. <clears throat> the um, so as you can see from this photo, this is what the site looked like when uh, Verizon was occupying the site. The site's located on, uh, <clears throat> on the south side of um, Crompon Road, almost at the Lexington border. Uh, this is Garden Lane coming out here. This is a, a Requa Road, which is a paper road that goes out behind the property. <clears throat> And um, this is the town of Yorktown here and the county bus garage is across and on its way over there. Next door to it is the little cabin and, um, and the uh, medical building after, after that. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so the, as I said, the proposed project is, uh, proposed property is this site here. It's 1.9 acres, it's, it's zone C4 commercial. Uh, Nestle's is a, a leasee, they are not the owners of the property. They are entering into a long-term lease to use the property for the distribution of bottled water. The uh, current zoning is consistent with the proposed use of the property. <clears throat> the uh, the north side of the property is bound by 202. As you get behind, as I said, Rec Requa Road is a paper road that goes out to 202. Um, that's a wet area. There's a, 
There's a water course that runs basically across and parallel to the property and comes across and, and heads its way and goes under 202 uh, into uh, the wetland, which is across the street. That's a state wetland there. Uh, the area behind the property, you can see there's about 200 feet of, of woodland vegetation. And then on the, uh, beyond that, on Old Crompon Road, you have a, a residential neighborhood where you have a mix of residences and some residences that are being used as commercial properties. <clears throat> uh, at the edge of the wood line, wood line here, which is elevated above the property. So this is, this is fairly flat in here. And in, then basically in this area here, you've got a, a, a rise that goes from moderate to steep. In some areas, it's not even uh, navigable by foot. And then you've got the rear yards of the properties in here. <clears throat> so the site as it exists today, uh, there, there's uh, the existing building here, which is approximately 25,000 square feet. The majority of the site, other than this portion in front of the building is covered with asphalt pavement and has been. The applicant has in, uh, in the last several months repaved the portion of it, this portion here, as well as did some work to the existing fences. Uh, they replaced the chain link fence along the front of the property with new fencing, I'm sorry, from here to here, as well as installed some rolling, uh, rolling gates that they're gonna use for security. And they added a gate back in this portion here, um, again, to secure the site. This portion of the site, it's still open and it's still an open lawn area. Uh, there's drainage on the property that exists. For the most part, we've uh, managed to clean out and video most of the pipes that are underground. Uh, they eventually discharge across to Route 202, across Route 202 this, to the state wetland. <clears throat> Some of the li lines were clogged. We needed to jet them clean. Um, there's an existing oil water separator on the property, which is located right here, that picks up all of the floor drains inside the building. Um, there is a pump, a small pump station here. This building tied into the low pressure sewer main, the town low pressure sewer main, which runs right across the front of the property and it's connected to uh, town water. There's an existing loading dock on the back of the building, which is uh, destined to come down. The entire site is in an A zone as determined by FEMA. <clears throat> the proposed building will be uh, uh, not the proposed, but the existing building uh, will be uh, fitted with floodgates at all the openings, uh, which are removable and, and could be installed uh, at the prediction of any type of flooding. Uh, from what we've been able to find out, there's never been a history of the site being flooded. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> as I said, the the, the project, is, the, the property is, is being adapted to uh, distribute water. Uh, the building will be retrofit with interior loading docks, which are located in this back right corner here. The existing loading dock, which I pointed out, which is here, is, as I said, is to come down. <clears throat> Trucks will enter the site from this location here and back their way into the loading docks. These are the, uh, the source trucks for the water. They deliver water to the site between eight and 2 a.m. Uh, once they're parked, the uh, staff inside the building, typically it's four individuals, will unload the trucks for uh, movement of the water into and onto the uh, the service uh, the delivery trucks which are are parked out in this area here. 
which I'll, I'll get to that operation in shortly. So as these trucks leave the site, they're gonna make their way around the building and out this security gate here. There'll be, at all the gates, there will be a, um, a fob sensor to open the gates when an employee or a truck is entering or leaving the site. All vehicles leaving the site will be mandated to make a right-hand turn out only. There'll be no left-hand turns uh, allowed out of the site. <clears throat> the, so as I, as I mentioned, you have um, the route trucks, which will all be parked here. And essentially the way the operation is going to work is uh, at 6 a.m. in the morning, half of the route drivers will arrive at the site, right? So that's these uh, uh, gold colored spaces here. They will arrive at the site and they will park using these existing parking spaces here. Typically you'll have, as I said, you'll have four uh, individuals inside the building doing the loading, I mean, I'm sorry, the unloading and loading. Uh, and you'll have one or two uh, manage, managerial uh, persons in the building at this also, making sure that everything is running smoothly and everyone has their route instructions. So these individuals arrive at 6 a.m. They make their way into the building they have a separate gate here, um, <clears throat> which is only going to be, hold on a second, let me just see. There we go. Uh, so this gate is strictly going to be for vehicle traffic, uh, automobile traffic only. Um, there are on-site safety protocols which are very strict and, a, uh, and a required to be adhered to. Uh, Nestle does, uh, un, under, all, under any circumstance, wants to avoid mixing the commercial traffic with the automobile traffic. So this area in here is gonna be dedicated to the automobiles. Again, this will be gated and they'll have a fob entry uh, uh, gate. So, once these individuals arrive, they will walk. There's a designated walkway that takes them into the building. They pick up their route instructions and they're ready to go. Meanwhile, during the evening hours, after while these, the, well, late early morning hours, while these trucks were being unloaded, <clears throat> two of the um, delivery trucks are backed into the building. They're loaded and put back in into position and park. This goes on all night until all these trucks are full and ready to go. So now these drivers pick up their instructions, get in their trucks, these trucks here, exit the site and make a right turn only out of the site and get on their way to, to their delivery routes. Those trucks will be off the site by 6.30. As those trucks are leaving, the next uh, shift comes in, the other half of the route drivers. So they'll come in, <clears throat> they'll park in these empty spots here where the route trucks that have already left or whatever spaces are available in this area here. Same routine, these, these uh, uh, Drivers will enter the building, pick up their route instructions. Their trucks are already loaded and ready to go. They will exit the site, exit right only. They'll be off the site by uh, 7.30. They'll return in the middle of the afternoon, park their trucks, back them into their spots as shown here. And then that same routine will happen every night of the week except for the weekend. <clears throat> um, as far as as far as other improvements uh, expected to be made here as part of this application, um, 
It's been a lot of discussion with the planning board about the aesthetics of the chain link fence along the front here. Uh, the applicant has agreed to replace that with a picket style fence, which will rep look something like this. Um, it'll be eight foot high to match the, the existing fence. However, the rolling gates will st still remain in place and those will be chain link. <clears throat> in addition to that, uh, there'll be some low plantings along the front of that area. Those plants will generally be kept at 30 or 36 inches high. Uh, the plants selected are um, hardy plants and they're tolerant to, to road salt. So they should um, survive, easily survive in this, in this area here. The, um, There's existing lighting on the site, which for the most part, uh, we're abandoning and we're putting in some new lighting up. <clears throat> There'll be two new poles installed, one here, and one here. Those lights will be directed inward and downward as, as agreed uh, to avoid shedding too much light towards the back. Um, we're, we've got enough light in here to provide safety for uh, the workers to get around and for trucks to maneuver around the site without any mishaps. Uh, there'll be one, two, uh, two wall packs here. Again, uh, as discussed, those will be pointed downward to avoid uh, any glare leaving the site. Um, we've provided cut sheets and details of, the, of that lighting. This is the truck turning movement diagram. Um, this is how the trucks will be entering the site and backing in to each of their respective loading docks. You can show these are uh, 53 foot trailers are their, their big trucks and there's no, <clears throat> no issue with them being able to make the maneuvers they need to, to get into the, into, into the loading docks. Um, this shows a truck making a left out. Uh, this was never updated since we've agreed to, um, to making that right hand turn out, but, uh, we'll get that, we'll get that uh, taken care of. Uh, but we certainly, um, have agreed to that and we are going to stick with that. I think we've also, we've even added some steinage uh, We've added some signage here, which indicates that there'll be no left turnout, that it's right turnout only. Uh, this is the signage for the building. Um, as you can see, it's got the Ready Fresh Nestle logo. Uh, that's going to go on the front of the building face, facing 202, um, which is uh, this elevation here. And it's going to go somewhere right on the, you know, right in the midpoint of the uh, uh, roof parapet. <clears throat> One of the other modification that's being made is uh, the front elevation or the Route 202 elevation, the windows are being replaced uh, to something more um, uh, aesthetically pleasing rather than that, that industrial warehouse type look which exists in the, uh, the other parts of the building. So lastly, uh, we were asked to uh, provide some additional information. Uh, we were asked to provide 
uh, phase one study. So the, uh, um, fortunately, the property owner had one done in 2016, which is fairly recent. We've supplied that. Um, and in summary, that showed that there are no environmental concerns on the site. Um, as I said, we had, we've uh, cleaned out, completed the cleaning out of the stormwater lines and we'll be able to provide a report on that also. Uh, the other point of discussion was the noise factor and uh, the board asked for us to do a, a noise assessment of the trucks maneuvering on the site, especially during the early morning hours. Um, so we brought in a, a, a consultant Tony Russo from Environmental Compliance Services, Inc., uh, who uh, did a noise assessment. We submitted the report, and uh, Tony's on to explain that. So I'm going to bring that up, and I'll let Tony go do his thing. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Uh, just give me a second, Tony, so I can get the sure. report up. Can you see that? Yep. We got it. You got it? Okay. Yeah. There's a figure, um, a figure four one, if we can go there. It's about the third one in. Tony, you have to introduce yourself. Yes, uh, Tony Russo of Environmental Compliance Services Incorporated, Middletown, New York. Uh, we were asked to come in and uh, do a, a noise assessment. Um, of um, residents, uh, in particular, their nearest property lines and the residents themselves, that is residential properties we can gain access to. And uh, we conducted a survey uh, between the hours of 9.15, uh, 12.30 midday. And what we did, and looking at this image, this, uh, this aerial, um, we utilized a single delivery route truck uh, backed it up on two routes, uh, and you can see that uh, up on the uh, north side or the top side of the figure, you see the uh, Nestle's water um, uh, facility building. Uh, there's backup beeper route one and beeper route two. What we, the concept was, is to uh, establish um, noise assessment locations and measure sound pressure levels when uh, the delivery route truck was backing up uh, along those two routes and, um, and also uh, obtain ambient um, sound levels. And um, the idea was to uh, initially um, for the first three noise assessment locations is to locate those, those points for assessment uh, nearest and south prop boundary line of the facility, uh, which is more or less the uh, northwest corner of uh, the residence uh, of uh, 3784. And these are residences that, that are on Old Crompon Road. And um, uh, NAL2 uh, was at the um, uh, northeast corner of um, address 3780. And um, Number three was up on the northwest side of 3756, pretty much a little west onto 3766. And this is on the tail end of the developed portion of those properties. The idea for these three was to see what the noise levels were um, relative to uh, increases over ambient. Uh, and we also, uh, thanks to Tom and Stino, we're able to gain access to two residences, uh, noise assessment location four and five. Four is pretty much set up between like a midpoint closest to that property line, that, that south boundary uh, facility property line. 
um, for 3780 and 3784. And uh, noise assessment location five is uh, pretty much very near the back door, or at least the stairway leading to the back door of that residence. And um, as I said, we, we um, initially uh, set up uh, NAL uh, one, two, and three to, to uh, measure uh, sound pressure levels when uh, the backup beeper was activated along route one and then route two. So we took um, 30 uh, measurements uh, at 10 second intervals, uh, slow response, you know, type A meter, decibel meter. And um, we recorded those measurements um, for each of those locations. And then we had gone back and did ambient also. And ambient pretty much was what was in the immediate area of land use activities, including uh, traffic along, primarily traffic along Crown Pond Road. And for noise assessment locations, um, uh, four and five, we did the same thing. We measured ambient and we measured the, um, uh, the sound of the backup beepers running across those routes. And um, what, we, what we learned was that and if we move along just beyond page six, Joe, there's a tabulation. One more, there you go. Okay. You see uh, in this table, and I have some qualifications down in the notes, we have um, the different noise assessment locations across the top. And then on, vertically on the left is ambient background, backup beeper route one, backup beeper route two. So I Noise assessment location one, uh, you can see that what the ambient level is uh, and for backup people one, uh, route one and route two. Now keep in mind, these are level equivalents, which is um, a, um, a calculation that's recognized to by planning boards and pretty much regulatory agencies uh, to um, measure sound levels, various sound levels over a period of time uh, which, when assessed, will give you a good idea as to whether or not you're going to get complaints for residents. And so that's highly recognized. So those were calculated. We included the calc sheets um, for those LEQs that were calculated. And um, looking at ambient, of course, uh, those levels are low um, and uh, across the board. And uh, for people out uh, one at NAL1, uh, which is close to Beeper Route 1, when you think about it, looking back on that image we were just looking at. Um, and so that was high. Um, also, uh, at NAL number 2 uh, was 60.32, which was the max. And on and on, and as you get to noise assessment locations uh, 4 and 5, you can see there's drops because they were further back, as you would imagine, they're further back. And um, so there's distance and a little bit uh, something to do with elevation. And uh, we noticed that also the existing building uh, acts as a barrier at NAL1, partially at 2. 3 is kind of wide open. <laughs> and the same, you know, goes for NAL4 and 5. You know, there was a little bit of a, a barrier at NAL4, by the building that is. And five, uh, there really wasn't a building. Um, and so it's kind of straight out. You can see um, Crompon Road. And so you had some uh, influence there by uh, traffic noise for the most part. And so um, looking at backup beeper route two, um, uh, as you go through, there, were Mac, there was a max on that as well. And then, of course, they were less so uh, for four and five. And in particular, uh, at NEL5, uh, we had a spike because a helicopter flew overhead. It was low flying. So I basically took a maximum for the 30-minute 30, 30 period and uh, threw that 61.6, and it's noted in the notes, and I plugged that into the two um, uh, points of recording uh, to kind of get some kind of consistency to bring it down. The actual level was 58.66 with the helicopter. Without the helicopter, it's 56.78. So it's just an effort to kind of bring this 
closer to reality using the maximum, which was caused by a, a sizable truck on Crompont Road. Um, and so, again, you can see some of the influences here and there, and um, it, it, it worked out pretty good. And, you know, looking at this table, you can see that um, the amount or the uh, change or the delta, you know, the increase uh, is, um, is noticeable in some cases, and in some other cases, it's not as noticeable. And um, uh, what we did is we... We uh, took this information and using uh, the DEC's um, noise assessment, uh, mitigating noise and, you know, uh, monitoring noise, assessing the noise and so on and so forth, their, their policy program uh, guidance document. We were able to um, compare these levels and make some sort of evaluation as to whether or not we're looking at any impacts. And so, uh, Joe, moving down to section six, if we get down to section six, And incidentally, there's a lot of write-up here and, um, on each of these uh, the results uh, for the set, the assessment that you might find interesting. And uh, what I've done is on, on this uh, page nine, on the under the, the subsector of the section of noise impact analysis, I um, included uh, from the DEC manual or rather the guidance document was a human reaction to increases in sound pressure level. You can see. You know, we have an increase or a change that's under five. It's uh, they claim human reaction is unnoticed or or to tolerable. Five to ten, it's intrusive, and so on and so forth. Joe, if you scroll to seven, page seven, um, I also included something from OSHA to give you an idea of what sound levels, typical sound levels are uh, with certain activities. You know, quiet room, forty decibel A so on and so forth. So basically it's just to kind of give you another reference, um, you know, that being OSHA as to what um, you can expect relative to, to sound pressure levels for different actions or activities. You know, keep in mind when we were looking at uh, noise assessment locations one, two, and three, I personally was looking to see how close we were getting to 62, 65 decibels because typically surrounding municipalities and have ordinances that uh, have thresholds uh, uh, for the nearest residential property uh, of uh, 62 or 65 decibels. And so, you know, back on looking back on that table, we never exceeded, um, you know, the 62 or the 65. We, as I said, we had two max uh, levels that was 60 point something or other. And, um, you know, looking um, down the page on, on page 10, you see the, uh, the deltas uh, for each of those three noise assessment locations. And thinking back on the, the page prior, uh, you know, zero to five, you know, human reaction, zero to five, it's unnoticed or, or tolerable. And then five to 10, thank you, Joe, is, uh, is in, in uh, can't see that, but uh, let me blow it up on my side. It's uh, intolerable, it's intrusive, that's the word. I'm very sorry. Uh, and so looking back on those deltas, we have values that are zero to five and also that are intrusive. Uh, but at no time did they exceed the 62, typical 62, 65 decibel threshold level, which for me personally is, is, is a good indication. And Joe, moving down to the next page, um, Mr. Russo? Yes. If I can interrupt for one second. Yes. This is unbelievable information. If you're Mr. Campolo up in his house at 2 o'clock in the morning on January 20th and they're backing trucks up, are you going to hear it? That's hard to say because I don't, I don't know where he is, if he's part of that group. Uh, there is a possibility. Typically, windows are closed. That's what they say in these guidance documents. Right. And, you know, we we didn't measure sound levels at you know in the uh, in the morning. Right. What we tried to do is to put those that truck right up against the line and have it be continuous. Now, you know, the trucks are not going to drive back and forth along the south property boundary 
Uh, they're going to be more a little bit internal. Uh, and in the case of the tractor trailers, uh, the maximum uh, would be two trucks uh, arriving uh, over a period of time staggered. And so they leave and then two others will show up staggered. And, and then when the um, delivery route trucks are finished being loaded, they'll be backed up into those areas that Joe described. And so it's not a bunch of trucks, it's just one at a time because they can't move more than one at a time after it's loaded. So it's hard to say. I mean, I, I you know, it's, you know, atmosphere, temperature, wind, you know, are variations. The positive thing about this is the distance a little bit of the elevation, as I noted in my report, but also um, you have that buffer or that uh, vegetated area. Uh, that makes a difference. Um, right. When the leaves are out, sure, that, that'll help. But you know, we did this when there were no leaves on the trees, um, as I said, and you know, putting those trucks up against the south boundary line best we can. Again, that was between the hours, as I said, between the hours of roughly 9.15, 9.30 to... 12:35, something thereabouts. Nonsense. So in the middle of the night when there's nothing else going on. Right. Are we going to? Yes. Can you hear me? Yep. Are we going to hear that beep if we're yeah. in his house? I would imagine you will, uh, but to what extent? It's hard to say. It's not going to be. It's not going to be. Um, you know, it's not going to be like what we're seeing at the property boundary. Hang on, Mr. Campolo. All right, I'm sorry. Uh, George, if you could just hang on until he's done with the presentation. Okay. Sorry. Right. Go ahead, I'm sorry. That's, I'm sorry. The way to, to determine that is to, you know, do it during the evening, you know, during the, uh, you know, 10 to 6 a.m., if you will. Right. You know, to get the sound levels that could be expected. Now, keep in mind, this is, a, you know, a land use we're talking residential against commercial, and um, uh, a good part of it is a good part of it is, is traffic, and certainly traffic is less so uh, during that time in the evening. Rich, you know, I, I want to say that I was out there for a good part of the study. It was Tom. Tom. Tom was a real trooper. Uh, anyway, uh, and. At, at the rear property lines where the edge of the wood line was, um, remember now, we were running back and forth three times constantly along the fence. And it, it was not, you can hear it, but it was in the background. It was not something that was like, you know, when you're at, standing at the truck hearing that beep it was something more in the background <clears throat> if i could if i could phrase it that way i understand if i may also am i on yes, if i may if i may also in a nutshell to joe's point yes there obviously is car traffic on route on route 202 road where the trucks backing up will more for a blend with that now, so it really is not much higher. In a nutshell, if your windows are open, you, you may hear it. If your windows are closed, you definitely All right, so your opinion, Tom, is Tom, your professional opinion is in the middle, generally in the, in the winter time, your windows are not open. Correct. Unless you're my wife. And people are not going to hear the beeping from 300 feet away. No, they will not. Okay. Joe, not to cut your presentation short, or Mr. Russo, brilliant information. Are we missing anything? Um, Tony, you, you, are you done? Well, I just wanted to just reiterate that the, um, if you go up one, one page, Joe, to 11. Okay. Uh, those are the noise assessment um, those levels for uh, uh, four and five, you can see a comparison. The background is uh, a negligible increase. I mean, I mean that's what we're looking at based on distance. Now, again, we were only able to get on two properties. There are reasons for that. 
we had some obstacles. We had dogs walking that we had to uh, take care of, thanks to Tom. And so, thank goodness, Tom was able to get us at least on two sites. So it worked out pretty good uh, relative to that, you know, that, that situation or those situations. That's basically it. Okay. So, thank you. Uh, Rich? Yes, sir. Also uh, joining us is uh, Emilio Diaz. He's the regional warehouse and process and supply manager. You've met Emilio a few times. He's come to the meetings. And he works in Albuquerque. What's that? He's the guy in Elmsford, right? Yeah. Uh, no, he's he, he's he's actually uh, more. He's regional. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and also, Chris Orfisi's on. He is the he's with Construction Associates. He's the project manager for the project. So uh, I'd like to throw it out to them just to see if they have anything else they want to add. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I don't. Thank you, everyone. Um, no, Joe, I think I think uh, Tony and, and you covered it. I know that one of, one of our uh, uh, supervisors that would be um, based out of this location was also on site. Uh, he was responsible for bringing the, the vehicle and, uh, and he shared with us the same impression as you did. Thank you, Emilio. Chris, do you want to say anything? Yeah, I got one clarification, Joe. Can you hear me? Does anybody hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, Just identify yourself, Chris. Uh, Chris, uh, this is Chris. Construction Associates, um, that's his, uh, National Project Management Projects. Um, just want to clarify, Joe, you had mentioned that, you know, make it important for the planning board to, to understand. Um, you mentioned Bob Reader on the trucks and the cars. But actually, most trucks and vehicles will be equipped with RFID, where the, the gate will actually start opening. You know, they're not going to be sitting in the road, like, waving a fob. It'll, it'll actually start opening as they approach or as they're waiting to make the turn in. So just a, something I think you might – something that they may want to understand, that there wouldn't be trucks. You know, the gate would generally be opening before they pull in. Um, one other point. Um, on the fence that um, you know, we were actually um, trying to request it to stay with the team link. And I'm not sure how much the planning board understood about that, but there's a just a security concern on that picket type thing that it's just not as secure um, as the chain link and easily bendable and people to get through. But Nestle's willing to do it. And it uh, doesn't meet their standard for security purposes. What what, are they, what security are they, are they worried about? People breaking onto the site and vandalizing the trucks. Well, the trucks are loaded with product and water, and you know stuff can be you know cases of soda to be passed through a fence like that. Cases of San Pellegrino. So you know that's why their standard requires a chain link. I mean, it's easily it's easily bendable in and pass product down through through a, a picket fence. All right, well, I think, and I appreciate you guys bending your rules. Uh, we have full faith in the Yorktown Police Department. They're always on the streets. They're always present. And they do what I want to say is an unbelievable job in the town. So I think you're going to be very happy with them. No, I'm, I'm sure, yeah. Uh, Thank you for the clarification. Why we were... Why we were turned around. So uh, that's it then, uh, Rich, we're pretty much done uh, with the presentation, unless you have any questions. Joe, when it, can you speak, uh, you know, because uh, if anybody's listening um, in on the uh, presentation, uh, just talk about the lighting quickly and how it was modified so uh, we didn't have lights shining in the direction. Uh, to the oncoming traffic and, and not shedding light off the site. You made sure. some modifications based on our prior comments. Mm -hmm. All to the residents, right. that's a great point. Right. Um, yeah, the, the previous iteration of the lighting plan, we had uh, wall packs along this entire length of wall here. Um, so we've eliminated most of them. We only have one at this corner here because we just need to get, to get this spot in here. But uh, essentially what we've done in order to meet the lighting standards 
that Nestle has uh, and to as closely as possible comply with the um, with the standards of the town code we've installed um, an additional light pole on this on this frontage here facing in uh, so these these lights will be facing in and downward um, so we get the effect that we need to, to get the lighting in the middle of the parking area here and in addition by eliminating these wall packs we've eliminated any potential for glare uh, on on traffic on 202 that might be heading westbound they would not be looking into those lights so that that's that's the that's the change that's represented on this lighting plan here. Right. And just to be clear, all loading and unloading of trucks is done inside the building. That, that's correct. Yeah, once the trucks uh, enter the site and they back in to the loading docks, everything is done internally. So I, I think that was a question that John Tegener had too. So the building, the inside build out and design is that such that the truck will completely pull into the building, right? Yeah, I mean, as you could see, as you could see by the, the, you could see this, right? The plan? Yes. Yeah. So as you could see, you know, only the head of the truck is sticking out. John, if I'm misspeaking, please let me know. No, not at all. So, <laughs> Joe, what's the state of the construction inside there? Uh, I'll, I'll have to let Chris respond to that. Um, as far as the state in, in of the loading dock, um, they're they're pretty much in place now. They're 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 probably uh, I'd say eighty percent complete. Is that a column line that it butts up against? Uh, not in what they're east to west or north to south. The back of the trucks. <laughs> east to west. Yeah, actually, we, we had to actually relocate. So we did some structural work and relocated some columns so that it wouldn't interfere with the doors. Now, wouldn't it, what about where the actual dock is? You, did you move some columns there as well? In the, the exterior? The interior of the building, where the, where the back of the trailer connects up to the, to the dock, to the floor. I think we relocated one column in that area. One column. Out, out at the front, we didn't relocate any columns because the wall openings were, the panels were uh, yeah. big. One thing, uh, most of these trucks, it's there, there's drop and hook. So th they won't be sitting there with the trailer sticking out. There's overhead doors and the, the, the trailers will be inside with closed doors. So you're going to drop the trailer and the tr tractor will drive off and How's that going to work? No, they drop. Well, they'll. What'll happen is uh, the the product will come in and they'll they'll empty a trailer. And as the trucks unload the empty water bottles, they go in a trailer. So when in in the during the day when the trucks come in, they'll drop a full trailer. They'll drop an empty trailer, a full trailer of water, and pull the pull the empties out. So in essence, the for the most part, the garage doors will be closed most of the time when they're loading and, un and unloading. Oh yeah, yeah. Because in the okay. winter, you, know, you want you don't want the water to freeze or the products. Right. To so it's heat. It's it, it can be a heated space. At this point, we have an alternate. We're not for now. We're not installing the heat in that area, um, but it may it may happen eventually, just because of budget. Okay. Chris, right, so those uh, the tractor and the trailer will both fit inside the building. No, no, no. They drop the trailer and the, tr the tractor hooks up, but, you know, takes the, tra the other trailer out. Got it. So, and then he leaves and he goes back. And, and so there's, it, you know, there's never a trailer sitting on the, the other drivers. They don't, the drivers don't sit there. They, they drop, it's called drop and hook. Yeah. So and hook another one and leave. I just want to yeah. have a, you know, have the public have a clear understanding that there won't be trucks sitting there idling with the headlights on shining up, you know, into the southerly direction toward the residential properties for extended hours at a time. You know? right. yeah, and honestly, <laughs> Emilio, you may want to just correct me on this. I believe those deliveries happen during the day, not at night. 
correct, Emilio? No, they happen. Those the the those big deliveries happen overnight. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's something that may go on the actual site plan as an operational condition. Mm -hmm. I, I think that that's worthwhile. I, I have another. I have a question for Joe too. Mm -hmm. I just want to, Emilio. I think there's only two deliveries at this site, right? Night. I'm sorry. What was that? Um, Chris? Two deliveries per day. I think we only get two trailers at this site. I think it would be closer to four, but they all happen throughout the nighttime because that's where when the warehouse crew is working there. Okay. All right. Yeah, you're more up to speed on that piece of it. So. What is it, John? So the right turn out only. Mm -hmm. That is for all vehicles? Yes. So the, de the delivery trucks, I'm assuming that they are delivering in a, the, the area, not just to the east, right? That's correct. So how, where are they going to be turning around? Um, they, they will find a route to which they will have to turn around. Maybe they're going to go get a coffee at Dunkin' Donuts. I don't know. I don't know. Um, how they're going to do that. They may have to uh, make a left onto Stony and then come back on the Bear Mountain. Uh-huh. Because uh, if, if they're leaving, if they're leaving, you know, like 6 or 6.30 in the morning, at least half of them, is there traffic to be concerned with in terms of making a left? Uh, my, my understanding is, uh, based on past discussions we, we've had together, you know, with the board, that that's kind of starting to end up, that's starting to be a peak time for traffic. Okay. Uh, it's starting to pick up around then. Um, I'm never down there at that time, so I don't know. I don't use that route. But uh, based on discussions we've had, that's, that seems just to be the start of the peak time. So um, the right turns make sense. Right. The only thing is, like, if they decide to, if they need to go towards the peak scale area to, or to the west, I don't think it would be a good idea to have six or eight or 10 trucks using, for instance, Old Crompon Road to get back to go west right. as a residential road. Because mm -hmm. that'll anybody, be- uh, John, are you familiar at all? Is there anybody else along that corridor where we, I'll call it a hardship, you know, where we kind of impose that kind of a hardship on the, uh, the tenant? On this road, uh, yeah, I mean, there there may be other you know commercial delivery vehicles uh, pulling in and out of the <clears throat> everything from the Shell station to everything else that's there. Mm -hmm. um, seemingly, they're free to make a left turn when it's safe to make the left turn. Yeah, I think I think most of them are. I, certainly, it is it's a it's a problem on that corridor. I don't think that, to my recollection, and maybe Robin can remember one. I don't remember that we have that on two hundred two. We, you may have it on the Taco Bell that you're, that's in front of you right now. Uh, they are proposing that one right out. Um, you know, cars are a little different and, and the times of operation here are a little different. So I wouldn't want to see, like I said, eight or 10 trucks getting to the West by using old Crompon Road. Right. And did we ever, I know there was discussion at one point that the Bear Mountain extension for some hours of the evening it allows commercial traffic. Is that accurate? It, it was, it's, I believe it is accurate. Now, I don't know if that's the little extension that we have, but certainly over going into the Peekskill area and Crown Pond area, that section, I believe seven, it's either seven to seven or something like that, trucks can use it. At least it was that way for a while. Right. And Emilio, can you weigh in on uh, how many routes may go westbound? Because I believe, my understanding of this facility, uh, that most of the, you know, being up against the river, that most of the stuff is is eastbound and south. So, yeah, I was just I was just looking at at the notes. Uh, um, yeah, and that is, and that is correct. The majority of the routes, I cannot I cannot tell you exactly how many of them, but I can get back to you on that. Um, okay. Are, are going that way, that's correct. And, and the local folks, um, the just happens that um, the folks that will be based out of here, the, the, the leaders and the supervisors, they're local to the area, so they're very familiar. They're actually the ones who suggested we should only do right turn 
uh, right turns out of the location because they know the area and they're familiar and they know that that could represent some issues. And they are also uh, working on, on their plan because that add time to their to their to their route time of course to the service time so they're they'll they're working on on what are, are going to be the, the the efficient and safe routes to get the, the the teams that need to go back the other way uh to to get that done yeah there you know there's a safety concern too as far as on their part is uh, making that left turn mm -hmm. John, okay. so it kind of sounds like. Oh, you missed anything on your end, Joe? I was just going to just follow up, you know, John. It just, it, it sounds like the amount of trucks that are going to need to circle back aren't, aren't that many. So. Okay. Well, that, that's good news. And if, um, if Emilio could give us the data for the file, that would be helpful. Yeah. All right, Joe, anything else? Uh, I'm fine unless you have something for me. Any comments from the board? Thank yeah, you I, have a, I have a comment. I think that uh, it's very erroneous to have uh, no left turn. If you're, those tractor trailers coming out of there, 53 footers, where are they going to turn around? They're going to go down to the uh, BJs and, and, and go in and come back? I mean, I drove a trailer once, and you're very conscious of what's going on. I mean, what don't these guys... Uh, given the, given the benefit of the doubt, they'll they'll move into traffic when they know they can, and if you try to get out from um, any one of those uh, like McDonald's and you want to go towards Peekskill, there's a light down there that stops the traffic when the when the traffic you know uh, towards Peekskill. There's a light. I don't know the name of the street. Maybe it's Stony. I know it's not Stony, but whatever it is, it's a light, and you get a break in the traffic really, really, really good break in the traffic. And we're asking tractor trailers to come into a, I, I, don't, I don't know, I don't understand how they're gonna do it. You know, you got a big truck there, you gotta turn them around. Where are you gonna turn them around? That's a good point. If, if we're limiting the hours of the deliveries of the tractor trailer to the middle of the night, there's probably not gonna be a lot of traffic there and it'd probably be easier to go left and go right and turn around. You know, I think you're thinking about the light at Lexington, Bill. Yeah, right. That's it, Lexington. But now that I'm I'm hearing about the restricted delivery times, um, you know, there's probably not going to be, and and maybe Emilio can speak to this. Are they going to be between eight o'clock and twelve o'clock primarily, or between twelve o'clock and eight? What is it? Ten ten o'clock at night to eight o'clock in the morning. Eight to two p.m. Eight to two a.m. Eight to two, so we will have traffic in the evening hours then. And, and John, the the from my understanding is the trailers actually are going to be coming down six. They're coming from Massachusetts, so they're actually going to be coming from the east and going back to the east. Oh, okay. I mean, you may you know you may get one that's going to go west. I don't know, but right. Most of all the products coming in from six eighty four. That's oh, okay. My, yep. So you know, as far as trailers, but uh, Will did make a good point because I've been there a lot. And I do notice that break in the traffic from that traffic light that's up, you know, towards the west. You do get that, you do get that break when that from that red on that light for whatever time that is. So right. it is the point. Right. Okay. Joe, anything else? Nope. John. I'm, I'm good for right now. Okay. Uh, Thomas, everything noted. Yep, all neighbors have been notified. Okay. Jim, any issues? No issues. All right, Robin, we'll open it up to the public. I know Mr. George <coughs> Paul has been waiting very patiently there. So that's, that's quite all right. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good. I would like to ask Mr. Russo to put that aerial photo showing the uh, noise assessment locations back up on the screen. Joe, you got that? Yeah, hold on. Okay. Just so everyone can gain perspective on where I am. You know, in some aspects, this works easier than the boardroom. <laughs> yeah, yes. you have to use a magnifying glass on the screen here. <laughs> okay, so I am 
the house to the west of 3784. I'm at 3790. Yeah. And all those woods back to the property line of the subject building is my property. From Old Crown Point Road to the property line of the subject is a total of about 400 feet. Now, all those woods look wonderful in the aerial photo, but if you come here right now before another week or two passes, you can stand on my deck and count the bricks in the back wall of the uh, the Verizon building. Uh, my time in this house goes back to when the Verizon building, uh, when Verizon was very active in the property, and they had 10 or 12 or 15 line trucks going out, mostly in the morning. And um, in the cold weather, they would, they would go out and start them up and let them run, and it would shake my house. The, the bulldozer that they've been using on the property the last two months, and he starts it up 7.30 every morning. If you are sitting in my living room in the front of the house, 40 feet from Old Crompon Road, you can feel the vibration in the house. So, and you'll see my property lines up directly with those loading docks. So... I'm a little concerned about the noise of the truck motor itself, the backup alarm, and the headlights, um, for one. And then um, did those wall pack lights at the back of the building, were they also changed, or are those still going to be there? Verizon, a couple of years ago, when they were still there, had put new lighting in, and it was hideous at night. So those lights along the back of the building um, are being replaced. Um, they're being replaced with with lighting that's going to be adjustable, so it could be pointed downward, uh, away from, or not, you know, directly towards towards your property. You wouldn't believe the light I get here from the diner. <laughs> no, no joke. Uh, what about, I mean, can they put up some type of a wall like you'd have along, you know, Route 287, like a sound barrier that's like 12 feet high or something that would block the light and the sound, possibly? Well, the, the lights, the wall packs, and Joe and I discussed this, I think, the wall packs should be pointed down, and I'm more in favor of ones that are not adjustable and that are fully shielded, you know, and are in full compliance with the lighting code. Yep, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, what about the, the, the holes at the back of the property? Say Basically, again. Lamp posts at the back of the property up against the fence between my property and theirs pointing toward the building. Those are being eliminated. Huh. Any lighting should be fully shielded so it, you can't see the light source with your eye. That's the code. And what happened with the discussion, Joe, with the webbing on the chain link fence? Well, we, when you're out there and you see the topography, clearly the, the you know, you have a site that's very flat, right. almost completely flat. And the angle of those headlights in comparison to where those homes are located because they're quite... A, there's quite an elevation difference. I, I think I, I, I want to say we checked and it was maybe at least 50 feet elevation difference between the base of our parking lot and some of the back of those homes. So the lights are not going to uh, be pointed directly at those homes. So I don't think any, any slatting in the fence is going to change anything there. How about lining that back property line with arborvitaes? Uh, there's, there's, there's no place to put arborvitaes. You could put them, you could put them on my property behind the fence. That's the paper road, George, I think. Yeah. Well, no, it's my, I don't believe so. I think my property goes all the way back to the fence between yeah. Nestle and me. I, I don't believe so. Yeah, no, it, do, it does not because there's a paper road in between. You have yeah. a, there's a the, lot that you own, I'm assuming behind your house lot, but it ends at the 50 foot wide paper road. Oh, and I see what you're saying. Okay, so the 50 foot wide paper road would actually be what butts up against the Nestle property. Correct. Right. And that's owned by town of Yorktown, right? 
Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. They, the town could give permission to put up some trees, some arborvitaes. Do we do we have confirmation yeah. on that? Because paper roads are a very iffy situation. It could be half the property is owned by correct the three seven seven five compound, and half are owned by the other. It, it's very iffy. I could try to find my survey, but I wouldn't expect you to wait for me to do that now. No, but I, Mr. Campolo, it wouldn't be on there. It's where you have a road that's not been dedicated to the town, and sometimes it falls back to the middle of it, and it's split by the two adjacent property owners. Yeah, I remember when they, they came, they were talking about buying my second lot to put that low-income housing about seven, eight years ago, nine years ago. Never low, we never... <laughs> Town was never doing low-income housing. Yeah. Not low-income. I'm sorry. Affordable. The the, the development yeah. went in across some DJs. I'm sorry. Right. Exactly. That's that's it. Yep. Yeah, Rich, when we did um, when we did the um, the MRI building, which is on the, uh, you know, Here, I could show west. Yeah, yeah, just west. west on the other side of the little cabin. Yes. Um, we we studied that. As a matter of fact, we had an exit. <laughs> For a future discharge point coming out onto Rec Recor Road, um, the planning board had to look into that. And at that point, I don't know, John. I don't know if you remember, but I kind of remember it, it. It was still a town. It was still in the town's possession at that point. Yeah, we our, our information that it's in the town's possession, but we haven't really looked that deep into it. We'll 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 try to do a little research on it, but I. I believe it's in town ownership. Um, and if, you know, there's always those conditions where people that are abut paper roads sometimes have certain rights that go to the middle of the road, which would then uh, possibly give Nestle rights to the middle of the road too. But I don't think that the town gives up their rights, even if that's the case. Yeah, and I think it came up in the Kia application too. Wasn't there something? Yeah, well, way at the other end of it. Yeah, and Yorktown Medical, we actually um, did the site plan in a with an eventual eventual connection to the rear. Right, right. In anticipation of that becoming a road. Jim, any input? Yeah, I've had a lot of experience with paper roads, and you're right. The ownership is always somewhat nebulous. The fact that a road is mapped on a town map means there's an offer of dedication hanging out there that's generally never been accepted. And it can be accepted by the municipality at any time unless all property owners on both sides revoke their uh, offer of dedication. There's also uh, a line of cases that if this road appeared on a subdivision map, the filing of that is an implied offer of dedication to the municipality of the roadbed. So it may be owned by other parties with what, for lack of a better term, I'll say, an unaccepted but potentially accepted easement for uh, road purposes hanging over it okay so at some point the town decides they want to build that road ultimately the town could accept to do that that's correct okay thank you all right joe you got anything else no that's it john no i'm i have nothing else at this time thomas you said everything's been noted correctly right that is correct all right, Robin, we'll open it up to the public. Outside of Mr. Campolo, anybody else have anything to say? Um, I don't see anyone. We did have um, the other email just asking if the distribution center would operate during overnight hours. Mm -hmm. And if so, what will Nestle and the town of Yorktown do to mitigate the noise, including the truck reverse warning sound? So that was... Um, one of the other neighbors, Mark Ioko of 3756 Old Crompon, so the other direction. Okay. I think Mr. Campolo has made some yep. interesting and very to the point arguments. Um, 
I think there's still some things we have to work out. So I would recommend at this point that we close the hearing and move it into the work session and not deal with the resolution at this point. Anybody have any thoughts? So move. You're going to keep it open for uh, 10 days written comment? Yes, please. Thank you, John. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Mr. Kempo, please keep in touch with the planning department and stay in tune to what's going on. Do I do that through Robin? Yes, that would be best. Really appreciate you staying up so late for us. No, oh, that's okay. I, I appreciate all of you. and Thank you for your attention to this. No. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Mr. Russo, thank you very much for your uh, very, very descriptive um, work you did there. Thank really, you. something else. Thank you very much. We appreciate you. All right. Rich? Rich? Uh, yes. Can, can I just ask on one more question? Oh. Sure, Robin. Um, I just got a late question just asking if there'd be fueling on the site. Mm -hmm. Emilio? I think he's gone. I don't think you had that on the plan. No, no Emilio is location. Emilio's oh, muted. Sorry, here we go. I'm here. Oh, yeah, back. Sorry, I'm here. I don't see his sorry, picture. Here. Yeah, hello. Yes, there will be there will be fueling at the site. The the majority of these trucks are propane power trucks. So there will be a vendor coming in to do um a fueling on site. Okay, what, that's interesting. What is will that you be doing? Will only, only propane will you be doing or, 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 or gasoline and propane? Um, I think the majority of the trucks are propane. I can also get back to you with the actual mix. The, the, out of the, I think about 28 trucks, I believe 20 or 25 of them are all propane. There might be some other, um, um, uh, a small number of trucks that are diesel trucks. Emilio, based upon what you're saying, it doesn't sound like you're planning on on-site storage of any fuel. It no, like no, no, no. Oh, okay. Uh, wet fueling. Correct. All right, we're gonna have to Thank you all, good night, thank you. Who was that? Hi, uh, so, George. Rich, can, yes, sir. Um, can, can we discuss this at, at your next meeting? Absolutely, okay. that would be a good idea. Okay. All Great. right, any other issues, comments? Thomas, thank you very much for uh, going that extra mile and really you know, getting into these backyards. Yep. Good job. We appreciate that. Thomas again. He's got away with dogs. <laughs> <laughs> He's a credit to the town. He should have been working for Greenberg. All right, guys. Anything else? No. No. Nancy, do you want to speak? Nancy? <laughs> sure. <laughs> All right. Do I have a motion to close the meeting? Motion. <laughs> Second. Right. All's in favor. All right. All right. Thank you all. Have a good night. Thank all you. right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Robin. Bye. Good night, everybody. Bye, right, guys. That's